Hi, this is James Zhang uh, with All Capital, and we're here with Cliff David, and we are going to talk about Phoenix. And so Phoenix is a market that a lot of investors are looking into a little bit more now, and I just wanted to bring him on and talk about uh, what he does. So Cliff, uh, maybe give us a little bit of your background really quick, and then uh, what you guys do in the Phoenix market. Yeah, James, absolutely. Good morning. Thanks uh, for having me on. Appreciate the opportunity to chat about Phoenix. For uh, my background is I've uh, been with the firm for 18 years. Uh, so Mark Smelchap, Institutional Property Advisors, my entire career. So I've had the pleasure of really doing this professionally, you know, since I got out of school. I'm from Arizona, grew up in Tucson, and have been selling apartments in uh, Phoenix my entire career. So it's a market that, that clearly is um, in high demand. I think there's visibility really across the country when you look at our metrics, investment drivers, et cetera. And I think from your perspective, being in Dallas, there's a lot of synergy between the two. So um, for us, my team and I, we focus exclusively in the 100 plus unit segment of the market. So really class ABC within that 100 plus unit envelope. Uh, just in the last three years or so, we've had the, the real privilege of transacting about $5 billion in volume. And then last year in 2019, of all the brokered sales in the 100 plus unit space, we had 32% market share. So uh, it's huge. I've lost. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, Five billion in in the last you know let's call it three three years and uh, a third of the market. So um, appreciate you you jumping on. And um, I guess I, I get I set it up as all right. I flew into the Phoenix, arrive at the airport, and uh, Cliff picks me up, and he's going to drive drive us around the city today. So uh, Cliff, if someone's coming in, what what would be uh, sort of your lay of the land here in Phoenix? Yep, sure. So historically, the Southeast Valley has probably been the, the foremost location that folks want to focus on, if I were to generalize it. And so when I say Southeast Valley, looking at the map, I'm going to really be talking about Chandler, Gilbert, Mesa, Tempe. Okay. Um, and then as you move north along the 101, you see Scottsdale, certainly a market that if not everybody, most people are familiar with, uh, but you generally don't see as much sales velocity there. And it obviously yields are more compressed. Uh, a lot of the product is, is newer construction. And so from a private capital perspective, uh, you just, just not a lot of velocity. So Southeast Valley, if I go back to Chandler, Gilbert, Mesa, Tempe, uh, I would say probably most desirable. Okay. There, um, it's interesting because, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about this today, but a lot of the reasons for that is economics, job economy, um, household demographics, i.e. educational attainment, uh, infrastructure, as you can see on the map there with the 101, the US 60 in the Loop 202, the northern portion being the Red Mountain Freeway, the southern portion being the Santan Freeway. So you, there's a lot of reasons for the Southeast Valley being so attractive. Uh, those are just uh, a few. And then if I were to migrate from there, I'd really go into more central Phoenix, if you will. So you see that 51 there, the state route 51 really connects middle of town to the north end of the Loop 101. And when I say central Phoenix, that's, that's very broad. You could really break it down into probably an East Phoenix pocket. And that's where the city of Phoenix runs into Scottsdale to the uh, east. So for this discussion, let's just say the 51 to the 101. Um, and, then, and then you really get into more of a true central Phoenix, which I would personally break that down into a, a midtown which is, is basically Camelback Road, a road that most folks are familiar with, south to the 10. And then if you were to go north of Camelback, you'd classify that as uptown. 
Um, and then lastly, go south of the 10, that would be true downtown. So okay. uh, very desirable, tremendous job economy, uh, a lot of multifamily construction in those, those pockets because of uh, the strong job creation that's been formed. There's been a migration to, to folks living more infill than maybe historically where Phoenix has been more of a suburban sprawl. Um, we've just seen a, a big migration, especially with a, a younger demographic moving to the middle of town uh, and, and the jobs are there now and the infrastructure is there now to support you know, a full lifestyle, if you will, living in the middle of Phoenix. So one, this, is, this is how I usually figure out um, where I wanna invest is, uh, where's your office? <laughs> uh, hey, fair enough so we are on camelback and 24th street okay. so if you kind of where your cursor is on the 51 logo there All right if you were to take that pretty much straight down okay to camelback road maybe a little bit more and you're just east of the 51 there okay. that's where our office is built more area the esplanade camelback corridor all those are really synonymous with one another uh but yeah, that's where we're located. Okay. All right. I'm just I'm just thinking about where the Market Smiller Chap office here in Dallas, and it's sort of North Dallas, right off the tollway. Great location, a lot of B product, and um, yeah, I'd buy there all day. So, um, all right. So let's talk. So I found this chart which I thought was pretty interesting, and it's like, all right, Phoenix compared to the top four metros here in Texas, and um, maybe just talk about Phoenix at a high level, sort of population, employment, um, income, and why people, why people are still buying there uh, over the cycle. I mean, it seems like, and, and sort of when you saw a pickup in, in the buying. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I would say just making a very macro general statement. I mean, Phoenix, the maturation we've experienced in the last 10 years in this cycle has been remarkable. I mentioned I'm an Arizona native, I grew up in Tucson, but I've had family in Phoenix my whole life. So I've, I've been in and around Phoenix really my whole life. So it, it's really turned that corner, meaning, you know, historically, probably fair to say there's been more of a boom and bust stigma on the market. So when I say maturation, I, I think we've really turned the corner. And some of the pillars uh, I would point to would be certainly in migration. We've had just from 2010 to 2019, about 800,000 people move here. So we saw, we saw our population increase by 18.7% in 10 years. And from a job perspective to really support that, about 530,000 jobs in that same 10 year window. So remarkable growth, remarkable, uh, job economy. It's much more diversified. I think that's part of the maturation story. It's no longer just the blue collar positions, the hospitality, the service workers. Those positions will always be part of the, the Phoenix economic fabric, if you will. But we've really diversified well and we're much heavier now in high tech, uh, biotech, um, just information technology with Intel uh, and the like. So, uh, and then medical, the medical sector, um, I can't stress the importance of that enough. We saw a big consolidation early in the cycle where some of our, our bigger medical providers uh, consolidated. So we kind of shrunk the, uh, the pool, if you will, but we grew, kind of grew the pie based on that consolidation. So you take Banner Health, for example, the largest private employer now uh, in the state of Arizona, Banner Health. So that's just, that's really the foundation. There's been a, a maturation in the last 10 years and it's really led to tremendous demand in the multifamily sector. Last yeah. year alone, oh, go ahead, James. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, just looking at sort of the high level numbers, I mean, Houston and Dallas are about 7 million in population. Um, and Phoenix is sitting right at 5 million and you added a million. So, I mean, it's definitely, and the household income is there, average rents are right there. So I would say it's almost like trying to catch up to Houston and DFW in terms of size. Um, but it has similar demographics in terms of growth 
to Austin, but probably twice the size of Austin, where we're seeing a ton of capital flood Austin right now, and Phoenix is twice the size. That's right. Well, and to that point on Austin, in 2019, Phoenix and Austin tied in terms of percentage job growth at 3.6%. Okay. So um, I think you're exactly right. We're, we're kind of moving hand in hand with Texas in a lot of ways, but, but maybe even more closely to an Austin. I'm going to, uh, let's, let's go deeper into Phoenix. I think we got the, you know, demographic population employment numbers. Let's dig a little bit more sort of by sub market. Uh, we spent a little time there, but maybe when you're looking at this map and where the employment is, uh, maybe talk about some of the big employers in these sub markets and sort of how that impacts multifamily. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll start with the Southeast Valley because we spent some time there. I've already mentioned uh, a company like Intel, who's had a presence in Chandler, for example, since the, the early 90s, and they've expanded their footprint uh, tremendously. And really now what's known as the Price Road Corridor. So if you were to, to look at that, that map that you had uh, put up there earlier, the Price Road Corridor is effectively where the 101 really terminates at the 202 in Chandler, and it turns into Price Road. Okay. Well, that is absolutely the, the greatest job concentration in the state in terms of the type of high paying white collar positions, professional positions. And, and really the corridor is not entirely built out. So that, that price corridor, as it's known today, is approximately 15 years old, plus or minus. And Intel has a multi-billion dollar facility at the base of the price corridor that, that really serves as the anchor. What, so, what's in that, in that area? So like when we were seeing like Toyota moved in probably like five minutes from my house with, they put their headquarters there and now we're seeing a ton of like new apartments go in there. Would, are there a lot of, is there a lot of new supply in this pocket because of that, because of the jobs? Well, no, actually. I mean, I, I would say supply in Chandler in general has been moderate uh, because I think the city has been very thoughtful and strategic about not delivering too much inventory there. Uh, and really the supply that's there, generally speaking, is post 1990s built or call it 1990s built in Newark. So you just don't have a lot of, of quote affordable stock to begin with. Well then when you go south of the 202 into the price corridor, as I mentioned, the inventory gets uh, even thinner and fewer deals have been built, call it in this cycle relative to other parts of Chandler. So uh, a very well insulated pocket, both on a macro and, and a micro basis when we're talking about price. So, um, so here in Dallas, if it's, you know, 1995 construction to maybe 2010, that's sort of just sort of like your A, A minus. Is that similar in Chandler? Is that fair? Uh, it is. Okay. Uh, that is fair. And then what's price per door for something like that in Chandler or Gilbert area? A minus deal. Well, I would say this. We're selling just, it happens to be good timing. We're selling a class A deal in Chandler now. and We're selling a class A deal in Gilbert right now. Both assets are, are, are essentially 2020 built. And price points are going to range between 300,000 and 325,000 a unit. Uh, so, you know, they, there's, there's also data points that would suggest upper 200s, maybe for product that's not quite as strong, maybe the location's not quite as, as dynamic. So, so um, that, that's just two live data points uh, at the present moment. But backing up a second to put it in context, I don't want all the listeners that think that's where Phoenix is today. The <laughs> that's the brand new stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand new, you know, high end product, big units, great locations. But last year in, uh, in 2019, 177 trades in the Metro, about 7.45 billion in volume. Our average price per unit was about 166,000. Okay, ABC. Uh, ABC, if you just let's boil it all down, that, that would be the average. Okay, okay. Um, 
so we talked about sort of Gilbert, Mesa, Chandler. What about sort of that next jump over to maybe Scottsdale, Tempe, and then we'll we'll go over the sort of Glendale, Peoria, Avondale after that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll touch on Mesa and Tempe first. That kind of rounds out what I was calling the Southeast Valley. So Mesa, Mesa is interesting. It is truly adjacent to Gilbert, Chandler, and Tempe. So it borders the um, the city. All the good stuff. <laughs> all those three, right? So it's 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 the low cost alternative, if you will, from a renter perspective to a Chandler and Gilbert and a Tempe, uh, as well as from an investor perspective, it's the low cost alternative. So you're, you're going to get a little bit better basis there. Rents aren't going to be as strong, but you're you're drafting off of the Chandlers, Gilberts, and Tempe's, if you will. Okay. Um, so I would, I would quickly summarize Mesa in that regard. Additionally, there's virtually no new supply in the city of Mesa relative to the Phoenix MSA. Um, and that's simply because historically, and, and when I say historically, let's call it the last five years, rents haven't justified the cost of new construction. Here and there it has, you know, there, there are new deliveries in the city of Mesa, but on a grand scale, it, it just hasn't been there. Um, and then when I, I slide over to Tempe, Tempe's mostly known for the main campus of Arizona State University, okay. uh, which is right there at Tempe Town Lake off of the 202, uh, uh, right at Rural, basically. So um, largest public university in the country. Uh, the, Student population is only growing. Uh, the footprint of the campus is only growing. And so when you really look at Tempe, you got to divide it uh, into north and south. So anything north of the US 60, generally speaking, is considered North Tempe. Most of that's going to tie to the university. And then when you're south of the 60, you are um, less student. There's a, there's a smaller student concentration, and then you're pushing into Chandler and that, that tech and, and business services story that we've already touched on. A uh, lot of supply in North Tempe, which I think is um, long term, we're very balanced. The demand is there. There's just you know maybe some short term uh, headwinds to deal with, but uh, it, it, arguably, you know, one of the stronger markets in the state. And it always has been, and, and I think it always will be. It's landlocked. That's the other thing. You know, the city of Tempe is truly landlocked. So anything that's built is a redevelopment. Okay. And then I guess uh, touch on Phoenix and the sort of central Phoenix and then uh, maybe hit Glendale and then we'll, we'll keep moving here. Yeah. So central Phoenix you know, we've kind of touched on the job economy a little bit. You asked where our office is, so that speaks to, you know, more of, of the white collar positions. You're going to see those along the Camelback Corridor. And then as you go down through Central Avenue, and, and that's really Central Avenue is the north-south arterial street that's going to, you know, you'll see uptown, midtown, and downtown through the Central Avenue office corridor or now commonly called the innovation corridor. Um, a lot of supply, you know, you can't really hide from it in the short run. A lot, a lot of supply is being delivered and that's because historically it was very undersupplied. A lot of 60s and 70s built stock, not even 80s, honestly, a lot of 60s and 70s built stock, smaller unit counts. That's what used to populate the, that central corridor. And, and, you know, with, with the occasional, you know, new post 90s built deal here and there, but is the migration to urban infill took place within the last 10 years, jobs were created because there is a, a large capacity of office square footage. Absorption started to kick in, jobs were created there, and so development and development equity flocked to that pocket because it was underserved. Yeah. Well, what we're faced with now, it, it's not prog problematic long term, it's just a short term uh, quote over supply. But I think it's just a matter of, you know, two, three years here as we 
round out this current development cycle and, and you really start to see that balance out well. But let me just touch on that real quick so I, I don't want to um, overlook this point. The demand for multifamily is Phoenix looks forward 10 years. We need about 150,000 units in the metro, generally speaking. Well, if you went back to the early 1980s, we only deliver about 8,000 to 8,500 units per year on average. So even if we just set our 40 year historical average was 9,000, you know, for, for easy math, we carry that forward 10 years, that's 90. But yeah, we need 150. So the, the takeaway is, yes, you're gonna see some pockets with some short-term oversupply, but we are severely undersupplied as we look forward over the next decade. Um, uh, just touch real quick on Glendale, because I wanna hit some of these other slides before it yes. comes up. Yeah, yeah sorry. sorry, so Glendale. Uh, Glendale is performing incredibly well. I, that's how I would summarize it. If you look at rent growth, uh, if you look at where the, the jobs are being created that are, are really influencing the performance of Glendale multifamily, I would suggest it's more along the 10 corridor and even further west beyond Glendale because that's where most of Amazon's footprint is. You've got big distributors, big uh, flex office footprints i.e. Sub-Zero Wolf is out there, Con Air, Dick's Sporting Goods. So there's such a strong infrastructure story with the I-10 uh, Industrial Corridor, the new Loop 202 that now connects I-10, the Loop 303 that's been built in this cycle. So for logistical reasons, the infrastructure has changed the game out there and that pocket of town has become the low cost alternative to the Inland Empire of California from an industrial and, and flex and distribution perspective. So I would suggest that's really the engine that's flooding into a market like Glendale that is very much a blue collar, maybe a gray collar workforce. Uh, and I've never seen the rank growth that we're seeing out there. I mean, I'm working on an assignment now and truly in the last, really since the pandemic, there's legitimate lease over lease rent growth in the neighborhood of 10%. And whether that's, that's a new lease or a renewal, uh, it, it's pretty staggering. And then lastly, when, you, when it relates to Glendale, the master plan of Arrowhead. Arrowhead's a very affluent part of Greater Phoenix, somewhat similar to a Chandler from a demographic perspective. When you hear Arrowhead by address, that's gonna to refer to Glendale or Peoria. So the only reason I'm bringing that up is I think the important notation there is Glendale, you, you've got Glendale generally speaking, but then you would wanna carve out the Arrowhead component for its master plan, because that's just in a different category than Greater Glendale. All right, um, I'm learning so much, so thank you. Um, so we touched on this sort of economic population housing i wanted to just sort of move through some of these a little bit quicker and hit um i'm trying to think so this was an interesting map and i don't know if you want to comment on it but this is just sort of like the u.s census data on top of uh the phoenix area and you know the green is essentially you know over fifty thousand in income yellow is probably 45 to 57 it looks like and then red is sort of in that 30 to 40 thousand dollar range so um after you have articulated the sub markets i think this matches is this a fair uh overlay of phoenix i would say it's fair yeah yeah, yeah I, I would say it's fair and I, I think what my comment there james would be if this is an important point in my opinion i'm sure your listeners would, would appreciate this if you look at from an income perspective the median income in phoenix is approximately sixty six thousand. Okay. Our average rent, um, to be specific, is 1184 as of 2019. So let's call it 1200. So if you annualize that, our rent to income ratio is 21 and a half percent. So we've talked so much about how great Phoenix is, and, and we could continue to talk about how great, great Phoenix is, but I think the affordability component 
income relative to where rents are is is one of the leading drivers to our market in my opinion and then when you were to if you were to put that in the context of the west coast markets of seattle of portland throughout the state of california it's staggering how affordable we are and and i think that is attractive to your end user your renter in your apartment community but also the investment capital migrating to phoenix suggesting that even if income stayed flat which i don't think they will there's still a lot of rent growth to take place to put pressure on the rent to income ratio in greater Phoenix. Uh, but again, we, I think we're going to have a lot more income growth. So, so that's kind of a tailwind and that's why you see, you know, 8% rent growth in our market. It's, it's pretty remarkable. So I'm going to be respectful of your time. You've got uh, one more minute. And so which, which one of these slides do you want to take for the sort of where we are in the market snapshot? Because at, at the conference, you will be uh, diving in a little bit more on where we are. Is there any uh, slide, if you were going to pick one slide to just take a, a shot at just wrapping up sort of where we are, what's sort of showing you the state of the market right now? Any particular slide that stands out? Uh, I would say, why don't we, let's just, Let's talk about, yeah, there you go. That, okay. the, you can pause it on that particular slide. Let's just wrap up with what I would call market velocity, so sales velocity. Okay. So I already touched on last year, uh, 7.445 billion, 177 sales, you know, banner year in, in almost every category. Well, if you were to look at last year's second quarter and you annualized it versus 2020 and you annualized it, not going to surprise anybody, we're way off to the tune of about 60%. And that is in terms of number of transactions, number of units sold, and volume. It's literally anywhere between 58 and 62% on those three categories. Not surprising, right? We're, we're, we're really in the, the middle of a pandemic or potentially you could say, you know, coming out of a pandemic. I would tell you this though, in Phoenix, Arizona, from a multifamily market perspective, although through June it's a 60% decline, it feels right now from an investment appetite perspective that there was never a pandemic. The demand is as high as it's ever been. Um, pricing is actually up compared to where we were at the end of 19, first quarter of 20. There's very little product on the market, which always helps prop up pricing from a supply and demand perspective. So even though 60% might be in our rear view mirror through June, we're gonna make up a lot of ground between now and the end of the year. And, and I'm sure during the conference, that's gonna be a hot topic because the past is relevant, but it's all about where are we going? And that's uh, where I'd like to, to spend some more time. Well, I appreciate it, Cliff. I've learned so much. Uh, it is hard for an outsider to look into Phoenix, but uh, I thank you uh, for your time today. And uh, we will talk to you a little bit more at the conference. Thanks a lot. Thanks, James. Looking forward to it. All right. See ya. Bye-bye.